an original member of the board, lost her spouse last night in a very public battle. Um, and we had lots of prayers are with Karen and uh, her family. So it's my understanding uh, that there is no executive director's report? I have nothing to report today, thank you. Okay, so the first item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, February 5th. So moved. <coughs> it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 5th without any additions, deletions, and corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, let the record know there was one exception. So with that, we'll invite uh, the QHP design team down front. So I will go ahead and kick things off. This is Addie Strumlow, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, I'm just gonna make a few brief remarks and then turn, turn it over to my colleague, Dana. Um, is the sound okay? Yes. Great. Lisa is here. It's okay back there. And, <laughs> and do we need to do anything to test that our, um, our colleagues from Wakely are available? Have a if they sound. wanna speak. Okay. Make sure we can hear them because it's on right now. Yeah, Julian, Brittany, are you on? Hi, this is Brittany. I'm on. Julian, as well. Great. Sounds good. Great. The gang is here. Um, thanks. So we're very happy to be here to present the um, the proposals for the standard qualified health plan designs for 2021. Um, just a few comments. Uh, one is that similar to last year, it was a bit of a time crunch. As you know, we're dependent on federal guidance. That guidance was posted on the 31st of January and published on um, February 6th, you know, less, a, a few days ago, essentially. So um, just wanted to give that context. Um, there's now a 30-day comment period on the proposals and it's likely to be finalized in April. So that's just context for the, the, um, the recommendations that we're making today. We're always dependent on that information from CMS, um, which, is, which is not in a final form. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is that I know it's helpful for the board to um, consider these recommendations with the context of the enrollment in, in the plans. Um, we are just f finalizing the enrollment numbers for 2020, um, and we'll have those hopefully ahead of next week's meeting for you all to see. Um, and then third thought is um, you'll see in here that we, we are not having to implement changes um, unlike past years uh, in response to legislation. However, um, you'll recall several years ago there was legislation related to chiropractic and physical therapy co-payments. Um, <clears throat> we and there had been feedback last year to kind of keep those co-payments to the minimum um, uh, level allowable within the range that's in the current legislation. And we're also aware that there is proposed legislation to move that range up even lower. So our strategy here had been to model the plans at the lowest, as close to 125% of the primary care copay as possible um, within a $5 increment for the copay. So we're not imposing a $43.70 copay on anyone for uh, usability reasons. Um, but that does bring it slightly below 125. So we just, we do want to highlight that. We thought that made the most sense um, taking the, the existing law together with the proposed legislation um, in hopes that we wouldn't have to make changes far down the road in this process. So just wanted to give you that context as well. Of course, it's up to the board how to handle it. Um, and I think with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dana to do our overview and dig into the plans. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dana Houlihan, for, um, Diva 
plan management director, and I'm joined on the phone by Julie Pepper, Brittany Phillips, and Brooke Adams of Wakely Consulting. They're our actuarial partners um, who've been guiding us through this process this year and several years before, so we're very grateful to have them. So I'll move on to the forward arrow. To point it at the computer. There we go. Thank you. So briefly, I'll provide this uh, kind of context and overview, then turn it to uh, Wakely to bring us through the actual plan designs and more context about the new um, uh, federal guidance this year and go from there. And as you know, we're returning next week for uh, further discussions, res uh, response to public comment, etc. So again, for context, very briefly, we provided the one-page uh, summary that looks this big and busy page like this for reference of the 2020 plans, what's currently on uh, Vermont Health Connect. We're here today to talk about the 14, actually uh, seven, standard plans. They're the same for both issuers. One at the platinum level, one at the gold, two at the silver, and three at the bronze level that we'll be discussing today. What we will not be discussing today, but what is included on the sheet, is um, seven additional non-standard plans, two at the gold level, two at the silver level, two at the bronze level, and one per issuer at catastrophic, which is not included on this page, but just for reference, I wanted to mention it here. So that's the full landscape of the, of the plans. Moving to slide four. For a little bit of review, I just want to um, mention our uh, wonderful stakeholder group that we convene in November each year to first review the new guidance as it becomes available and then to discuss the plan design changes that need to be made uh, at each meta level going through the process. So um, from the state, we have myself and the manager of outreach and education who brings that perspective. We have at least two participants from each issuer who are actively involved. We have a representative from the Vermont Health Advocates Office and staff, at least two each, from the um, Department of Financial Regulation and from Green Mountain Care Board. We have very good active uh, discussion. It's very thoughtful and um, enrollee focused. Um, I can say that we don't, we may not always reach consensus on our final decisions, but we have robust discussion and everyone has an opportunity to um, make their views known and I believe that we come up with better uh, decisions based on all of that input. Again, I won't read this, but for our general approach, these are values and uh, principles that we've adopted as a stakeholder group to always bear in mind as we um, make these changes. Value, affordability, attractiveness, usefulness are certainly very enrollee-centric. Stability, thinking about the marketplace as a whole and what's uh, going to be um, good for the sustainability of our enrollees and easy to explain and not cause any disruption by making changes that are difficult to understand or adapt to. This frames our approach taken for the, um, the task of deciding on benefit changes uh, at each plan level. We believe it's important to have these strategic minimal increases rather than perhaps, um, and you'll see examples of this, where there were some plans for 2021 that did not require changes. We opted to um, suggest minimal changes uh, in the interest of avoiding a bigger change in a future year. Always mindful of the cost to consumers. Um, you'll, you'll hear Wakely explain the model that they've created to give us a directional view of the uh, financial or the premium impact of a um, benefit change. And that's one of the important factors that we 
we keep in mind of deciding whether we will implement a, or recommend a change or not. And then, of course, consumer education is, is vitally important. We, as we've, as we've said, it uh, contributes to the stability in the market and um, helps all of our consumers, we believe, to make informed um, plan choices. So we avoid making complicated changes to benefit designs that are already complicated enough um, just to facilitate that. Moving on to slide seven, I'm happy to report that silver loading will be allowed again this year and will be implemented for in the 2021 plan offerings. This will be the third year that um, Vermont Health Connect has offered silver loading. We're in good company with many other exchanges doing this. Um, and again, a very brief overview. The loaded premium is is uh, for silver plans that are offered on Vermont Health Connect. That's to fund the uh, CSR program that was discontinued at the federal level. That higher premium on the silver level results in a higher benchmark plan, that second lowest cost silver plan that determines uh, the APTC, the premium subsidy, which is the main goal. So that um, uh, our consumers are getting higher um, APTC they than they otherwise would. Those consumers can take those that subsidy and apply it on a silver plan and also be, if they're eligible, receive CSR, or they can take that APTC to another metal level and buy, for instance, if they're, if they may um, expect to be a higher utilizer, they may be interested in purchasing a gold plan at a higher actuarial value using that subsidy. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, it also provides the benefit of a an unsubsidized individual market enrollee or our small business enrollees uh, to purchase silver plans directly through the issuers at that lower premium that, that is not silver loaded. This is for the silver plans. And I want to point out that the the silver loading program has no premium or benefit impact on um, the other metal levels. I meant to mention as well that the um, what we call the reflective plan, the non, the silver plans that are offered directly through, through the issuers have one benefit difference, which is a, a $5 copay, in, a higher copay, or 5% co-insurance um, for the silver plans that are offered directly through the issuers. Those are the reflective plans. So continuing that again for 2021, we see as a, as a good thing. Briefly, here's an overview of the timeline. So this month, our goal is to um, present and get approval for our standard plan designs. In March of this year, just uh, next month, the issuers submit their forms to Department of Financial Regulation. I'll point out that that milestone was moved back a couple of weeks because of the delayed uh, release of the federal guidance. Then, as Addie mentioned earlier, in April, we expect to get the um, final federal guidance and the IRS limits on high deductible health plans, not, not available until then. Uh, so if necessary, we will, we will definitely inform the board of any changes to the plans, you know, based on the final regulation and if, if required, come back for approval. Rate approved, excuse me, the rate submission is in May, which goes through several other important milestones with the uh, decision of rates in August. At the end of August, uh, DIVA completes the plan certification, the formal notification to the issuers that their, which plans will be offered on the exchange. And then of course, open enrollment for 2021 begins November 1st. We have a lot to cover, so I, I handle that quickly. Are there any questions on the kind of framing and context? Mm -hmm. I have one Just one question on 
slide before, um, the unsubsidized silver, and you talked about um, business owners, but can individuals get that cheaper from the issuers, and do they know that? Yes. And do they know they can go to, the, they don't need to go to the exchange, they can go to the... Those, yes, those reflective silver plans are only offered through the issuers, and we highly encourage any anyone who may be, you know, getting, uh, going through an eligibility check at the exchange, if they are interested in a silver plan to go to the issuer, enroll directly, and those reflective silver plans at lower premium are available to them, yes. Okay. Well, that Definitely, and that's, that's, um, and you know, that messaging is key, and it's it's also emphasized in the plan comparison tool. Okay, so moving to slide nine, I'll turn it over here to our partners at uh, Wakely Consulting. They will go f give us an overview of the regulation changes, <clears throat> including the actuarial value calculator. Uh, notes and caveats to the presentation, and I want to remind everyone that our, our the way we frame our um, proposal is for each metal level, we provide you a snapshot of the uh, changes to that plant, those plans at the metal level, one at a time, from 2015 to present. Then we present the uh, a view of the current 2020 plan design, a proposed plan design, and an alternative. And then we also summarize for you the kind of points that led us to that decision one plan at a time. Okay, so I'm on slide nine. Brittany or Julie, I'm not sure which of you will um, talk us through this, but let me know which slide you, you know, when you want to make a change and I'll drive us through from here. Great, thanks Dana. This is Brittany, I'll be walking through the, the presentation. Um, I think we've kind of touched on the outline on slide nine so we can move ahead to slide 10, um, which is a, an overview of the changes to the notice and benefit of benefit and payment parameters for 2021. Um, so the couple items that we pulled out here to highlight um, are the first, the annual limitation on cost sharing. Um, so this is the individual out-of-pocket maximum that, that issuers can include in their plan design um, and it's increased every year. So for 2021, um, it was increased to $8,550 from $8,150 in 2020. Um, so this increase of $400 increase is larger than um, most of the prior changes we've seen which has typically been around $250 each year. So there's a little bit additional room um, provided with the 8550 than what we've generally seen each year. Um, we'll notice this, note this in a, a couple of slides as well, but this limit does not apply to the health savings account qualified high deductible health plans. Um, there is a separate maximum out of pocket for HDHPs that's released by the IRS. It's usually released in the spring around April. Um, so we don't have that limit yet for 2021. Um, the other item we wanted to mention is that CMS um, is encouraging issuers to implement value-based insurance designs. Um, so in the regulations for 2021, they, this um, VBID offering is not required by issuers, but CMS is encouraging it. Um, the idea is that issuers would offer lower cost sharing on what they've um, called high value services. So these are services um, such as uh, maintenance drugs, um, those sorts of things, high blood pressure or uh, blood pressure cost um, uh, monitors. Um, and the idea is that by maintaining these items, um, the, the consumer can um, actually save costs. Um, down the road by either, um, similar to preventive, by either, you know, uh, maintaining their their uh, drug use um, in order to, and doing those maintenance drugs and keeping current conditions that they have under control in order to avoid some higher cost services down the road. Um, so for 2021, like I said, this is uh, optional. So issuers have the flexibility to adopt some, all, or none of the cost sharing designs that CMS included. Um, 
For, because the regulations were released so late and not in line with the current um, version of the standard plan designs, um, these VBID designs are not included in our recommendations for 2021, um, but this certainly could be revisited in future years, especially if CMS continues to um, push those, those types of designs. Um, there's also other changes that we haven't listed here in the regulations. Um, these are items that don't necessarily impact the plan design um, directly as the items above. Um, so consider um, this kind of a, a really brief overview of a couple pieces of the, of the regulations for 2021. Can we ask questions of the slides as they go? Sure. Sure, absolutely. So my, my question is, is there a formula that uh, the feds use to determine a $400 increase, and what's the process to determine that? Yeah, so it is uh, based on a formula. Um, I don't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head, but um, essentially it takes the original um, limit that was placed in 2014 um, and is ratcheted up each year um, based on uh, changes in in a, an index value. Um, Julie, I don't know if you remember exactly how that, that's determined each year um, specifically. I know there was a change last year to the formula as well. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's a lot of different formulas they use for different increases, so we can definitely look at that and get back to make sure we bring that to the meeting next week as well. Uh, but yeah, some of them are based on, on kind of the inflationary factor for for healthcare, but I'm not sure if this is one of those or not. So we can make sure that we get that answer for you and, and get to it. Super, thank you. Actually, if I can add a comment, I'm hoping that the, the vivid, you know, the value-based insurance design recommendations are incorporated in future years. I see real value in encouraging consumers through cost-sharing for high-value care to, you know, have, it seems to be in line with what we're trying to do with the all-payer model and encourage more primary prevention and <coughs> maintenance of folks on diabetes and all of those things. And so if, if the insurance design supports that, I think it would be really helpful to align um, these plans with what we're trying to achieve in population health. So I recognize that the time issue came out late. I totally recognize that. That's what I'm saying. I hope that we can incorporate that in future. Yeah, I think just to, just to comment, I think we totally agree that it's a timing issue, but also there's very little information about what they're actually proposing, and so and it is just a proposal. So I think once we have time to see what they finalize this spring and digest it, the timing will work out nicely for 2022. My question about the EBID was, it sounded like from what I haven't read the full regulation, but it sounded like that they had specific examples of what they were proposing, not necessarily that it was hey, states, you know, or issuers, please look at me then, right? So I wanted to ask about that. Is that their approach is to be very prescriptive about it, as far as you can tell from the initial proposal? Uh. So from my read, they have they do list very specific proposals, but none are um, there, there's no uh, kind of what would you call it like requirement on the states at all. So it is kind of this, you know, broad directive to issuers to explore this, and they do make a comment about they're not sure how it would interact with those states state exchanges that require standard plan designs, and that that might be a conflict. So I think you know there's some room to to explore there. That's interesting. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that in 2012, when we were first looking at standard plan designs, we looked at incorporating value-based insurance designs. Julie might remember that conversation from a million years ago. Um, and I do. And that's partially how we ended up with having certain services be first dollar covered. Okay, to move on? Yep. Okay. Okay, so on slide 11, um, just really briefly an overview of the actuarial value calculator. I think most people are probably familiar with it at this point, but just as a reminder, um, this is a model that uh, societal releases each year. Um, each year is updated. Generally, the updates um, include at a minimum trending the underlying um, claims to the, the new um, benefit year, so for this year it would be 2021. 
Um, but it includes inputs for various plan design features, deductibles, out-of-pocket maximum, um, member cost sharing for a variety of service categories, um, including co-pays or co-insurance and whether or not the deductible applies to those categories. Um, it should be noted that the, the service categories that are included is not completely, um, fully exhaustive. So it includes, I think, about 20 service categories, hits most of the major ones, you know, ER, inpatient, primary care, those types of services, but there are a lot of specific service categories that are not explicitly included in the model. Um, also, there are some plan design features that are not supported by the calculator. Um, so if the impact for these features is considered to be substantial, the act an actuary can modify the input to most closely represent the plan design or can modify the results of the calculator to account for these features, which requires an actuarial certification. So just to know there are some plan design features um, specifically around the pharmacy limits in the Vermont standard plan designs that do require an adjustment. So um, you'll see that the um, output of the ABC has been modified to account for, for those features in the standard plan design. Um, again, the resulting AB from the calculator is really meant to bucket plan designs into the different meta levels. Um, it's not necessarily the same as the pricing AB that carriers will use to determine their premium. Um, so again, the federal calculator is based on national data. It's a requirement for all issuers to use the calculator to determine the meta levels. Um, but generally for pricing, um, carriers will use their own experience specific to the area that they're pricing. Um, and the methodology of the, the models that each carrier uses may differ from that used within the, the actuarial value calculator. So on slide 12, now looking at just the changes to the calculator from 2020 to 2021. Um, this year, the calculator actually underwent some drastic changes in terms of the data. So rather than just trending the data forward an additional year, um, the underlying claims data was actually updated. Um, so it's now based on 2017 individual and small group data, um, trending forward to 2021. Uh, the 2020 calculator was based on 2015 claim data, so a couple years older, that was trending to 2020. Um, so because of the, the change in the underlying claim data, there, there's some additional movement um, within the ABs for the standard plan design this year than what we've generally seen in the past when the data is just trended and not completely um, revamped. Um, there were also some changes to the continuous table spending buckets that um, particularly could, in, could have impacted the value of changes in the out-of-pocket maximum um, for plan designs as well. So um, both of those changes really require um, all meta levels to be reviewed and um, to look at potential changes. Um, with the change to the underlying data, the bronze plans um, are now particularly difficult to meet um, the AD de minimis requirements based on the results of the draft calculator. Um, so when we get to the bronze plans in particular, we will go through that in a little bit more detail, but we just wanted to note that there's some more um, changes required to the bronze plans than we've seen in the past um, due to the, the draft ABC. Yeah, and, and just this is Julie, just adding to that a little bit, um, you know, there have been some fairly um, public letters to the societal based on some of these changes um, and how they're not necessarily in line with most societal's intent before. Um, California's is probably the most public letter that was sent. Um, so it is possible, it's our understanding that societal is aware of some of these issues. Um, I mean, some people are asking, you know, are they trying to get rid of bronze plans, for example? Um, we don't think that's their intent, but it is um, very difficult to get a, to actually have a bronze plan um, without the expanded range now. Um, and so, one of the again, just additionally clarify or you know, caveating that the, the actual value calculator is draft. We think it's highly unlikely that they will make any changes uh, for 2021, given the timing of where we're at now and how involved it is to make changes to the actual value calculator. Um, however, it, it's a possibility, but an unlikely one 
um, but also caveat in that it's possible they'll make changes in 2022. So it's possible that even if they don't make changes and we have to live with the calculator for this year, there might be a little bit of whiplash for next year. So just keeping that in mind. This is kind of a question and kind of a comment, but uh, I'm always reminded when we go through this process that um, one of the challenges, I think, for consumers looking at the changes in the plan designs over time is actually driven by the AV calculator being based on federal trends and not Vermont-specific trends, because that means that, let's say we're successful in curbing healthcare costs, that will not necessarily be reflected. Uh, it'll probably get lost in the federal data, so it won't necessarily, the trends won't necessarily track when you're then coming up with changes in cost sharing. Does that make sense, Julie, what I'm saying? <laughs> Am I thinking about that the right yeah. way? Yeah, agree. And I know at some point we've talked about whether having this stuff, because the states can create their own actual value calculator with their own data. Um, and their own trends. And so, you know, I, I think in the past it has, it's, it's been, well, it's not really worth it because it is a bucketing um, tool more so than it is a, you know, um, pricing actual value. But if you get to the point where you can no longer get the plans to pass, you know, it, it, that could still be something that would be up for consideration, I guess, for the state to consider. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we could look to at the national, but that we have the continuous table, so you have the allowed amounts for each of the meta levels, so you could compare those to actual data in Vermont to see how those compare as well. I don't believe we've made that comparison. Um, we do, try, but we could do it easily. Um, if we wanted to. I don't think it necessarily for this year, but I just thought I'd bring that Okay, great. So moving on to slide 13, um, we just wanted to touch base on some notes and caveats um, in looking at the, the plan designs. Um, as has already been mentioned, the regulations in the federal calculator are still in draft format. Um, so any changes between the draft version and the final versions of these um, two documents could impact the, the actuarial values and, and the resulting plan designs that we're showing here. Um, so, based on this, when comments were due on the calculator, it's possible the final ABC may not be released until March. Um, I think the regulations and the final notice is probably a little bit later than that, maybe even um, hitting into April, it can be expected. Um, also, as I mentioned, the federal HGHP limits are not yet released for 2021, so including this includes the minimum deductible as well as the out-of-pocket limits. Um, the 2021 minimum deductible and MOOC are $1,469. Um, the proposed plan designs um, that we're going to go through for the HGHPs um, don't currently account for any changes in the deductible or, or out of pocket maximum. Um, so, given that we're not expecting changes in the out of pocket maximum or we're, we're not counting on changes in the out-of-pocket maximum that's a bit conservative and, and shouldn't need to impact the um, plan designs we're showing here. Um, the minimum deductible would impact some of the plan designs if it were to be increased, um, but generally it increases about $50 every two to three years, um, and it was just for increased for the 2020 plan year. Um, so we're not anticipating an increase again this year, but it's always possible. So just want to caveat that. Um, and if there are any any changes that will impact the plan design, um, Diva and Dana will will follow up with the the board, um, noting any of any of those impacts. Slide 14, um, as we mentioned, uh, the later slides will include an estimated premium impact. Um, so we just want to note that the premium changes that are shown is really just meant to illustrate the trade-off between um, premium increases and cost-sharing increases for the member. Um, the actual premium change is going to be based on a lot more information than what we've included here, um, including the carriers models, their own experience. Um, what we're showing for the premium change is based on a weekly benefit model. Um, it hasn't been adjusted for certain benefit designs that are specifically accommodated in the model, um, such as the uh, 
embedded drug um, limit and on the HDHPs. Um, and so they're, it's really just a high level estimate to kind of show that trade off between cost sharing and, and premium. So on slide 15, um, we have a summary of the 2020 plan designs under the new 2021 draft calculator um, in that table at the bottom. So the gold, uh, silver, and bronze deductible plans, both with the and without the drug out-of-pocket max, are required to make changes in order to meet the de minimis requirements. Um, the CSR plans associated with the silver deductible plan also require changes, um, but ultimately those plan designs depend on the final base silver plan design um, as well. So again, we're going to go through all of the, the plan designs at all of the metal levels, even if changes aren't required. Um, we reviewed it to see if changes were desired in order to avoid an AV increase being passed on as, as premium increases as well as limit um, some of the increases that might be required in later years if no changes were made today. On site 16, um, we briefly wanted to touch base on the chiropractic copays. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there is um, a proposal out to limit the chiropractic copay um, to less than or equal to 125% of the PCP copay. The current regulation um, limits it to between 125 and 150% of that PCP copay. So um, for most of the, some of the silver and bronze plane designs, this would require a reduction in the chiropractic copay. So even though this regulation is not finalized, um, we went ahead and included um, adjustments to the standard plane designs to limit it to um, the nearest $5 increment that's below that 125%. Um, so that should this uh, be finalized, no further changes that are required to the standard plan design. We also wanted to note that um, physical therapy copays are currently limited to between 125 and 150% of the TCP copay. Um, the draft regulation that is out there um, does not specifically require any changes to the physical therapy um, copay limits. However, um, based on feedback from the stakeholder group, it's easier and preferable to continue to set the physical therapy and chiropractic copays equal to each other. So again, in the standard plan designs that we're um, showing here, we've limited the physical therapy as well as the chiropractic therapy to that 125% limit of the PCP copay. So on slide 17, um, we just have a really brief uh, review of the changes that require Green Mountain Care Board approval. Um, so certain changes below um, the limits shown here do not require formal approval. Um, we're showing all of the changes that we're suggesting in the recommended plan designs um, to be made, even if they don't require that formal approval. So. You'll see on the following slides, anything that's shaded in kind of a peachy orange color um, is a change from the 2020 plan design. Anything that's shaded in green is a change that also requires um, formal approval. Um, we also have a few changes that are actually a benefit increase to the member, um, so reduced cost sharing. And so in order to highlight those and point those out, um, they're bound by a couple asterisks. So just as we're going through those later slides, so you know what each of the different colors and symbols uh, reflect. Okay. So now finally getting into the recommended plan design. So on slide 18, we've got just a brief summary of all of the changes that we are um, recommending in the standard plan design going from 2020 to 2021. Um, as you can see, only a couple of the plan designs actually require formal approval. Um, that's the bronze plan, uh, both bronze deductible plans actually. So the one with the pharmacy limit and the one without the pharmacy limit. Um, so we'll go through each of these changes in a little bit more detail um, as we're going through the plan design. So slide 19, we start to get into the platinum deductible plan. Um, 
And so as Dana mentioned, the um, general structure we're going to follow for the remaining slides going through each of the plan designs is the first slide is going to show a, an overview of how the plan design has changed over the years um, and some of the history of it. The next slide will um, include the 2020 plan design, the recommended plan design, as well as an alternative plan design that was reviewed. Um, and then there's going to be a third slide that just highlights some of the considerations um, that were discussed in choosing the recommended plan design. Um, so for the platinum plan, there were actually no changes made to this plan from 2014 to 2016. Um, in 2017 through 2019, the deductible was generally raised a little bit each year. The um, out-of-pocket maximums were also increased a couple times. Um, and then in 2020, so just last year, um, kind of across the board, copay um, changes were made. So um, the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums were, were set equal um, to the 2019 design, but there were, was a 5 to $10 increase in the copays for PCP, mental health, specialist, urgent care, ambulance, and generic. So really kind of spreading the changes across several service categories. So on slide 20, now looking at the recommended plan design for 2021, um, the recommended design really just makes a minimal increase to the medical out-of-pocket maximum and pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum. This plan design is one of the ones that did not require changes. Um, based on the change in the uh, calculator for 2021, there was actually a slight reduction in um, the AV for this plan. However, as we mentioned, kind of making some of these small incremental changes now can help avoid some larger changes in future years. Um, additionally, uh, last year, because the firm, uh, minimum deductible on HHPs increased from 1350 to 1400, um, the pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum was increased to 1400 on the HHPs. Um, so by increasing both of these values, we keep the consistency between the deductible standard plans and the HHPs. In the alternative design, um, we also increased the ER copay to $125. Um, this was really, again, the, the ER copay had not been updated um, since 2014. It had not been increased. Um, so this was reviewed to try and kind of further limit the premium impact um, going from 2020 to 2021. Ultimately, the stakeholders preferred um, the middle version that just increased the out-of-pocket maximum and left the, the ER copay alone. Uh, moving on to slide 22, um, the gold deductible plan. So here we're showing the, the history of this plan design. Um, similar to the platinum plan, the, this design did not have any changes from 2014 to 2016. Um, since that time, there's been um, a variety of increases um, across the deductible, out-of-pocket maximum, um, the coinsurance was increased from going from 2017 to 2018. Um, and again, last year, uh, kind of across the board, copay increases to um, PCP, mental health, specialist, urgent care, and ambulance. Um, again, so trying to spread those changes across last year across several different service categories, so one wasn't impacted more than, than others. So on slide 23, looking at the recommended and alternative designs, um, this plan is outside of the de minimis range as is and did require changes in order to meet those requirements, those de minimis requirements. Um, so in the recommended plan design, uh, we increased the deductible $200 to 1100 um, increased the out-of-pocket maximum to 5200 um, again, increasing that pharmacy um, out-of-pocket maximum to 1400 to be consistent with the HHPs. Um, and with just those changes, this plan design was still just slightly outside of that de minimis range. So we also reviewed looking at 
increasing the generic and preferred brand copays. Um, so you can see the difference here between the recommended and alternative plan design. The recommended design has a slightly lower increase to the generic copay at $12 um, versus 15. So the silver uh, deductible plan currently has a generic pharmacy copay of $15. And so um, it was preferable to keep the copay on the gold plan a little bit lower in order to try and um, keep some of that separation between the gold and silver plan design um, in that case. So both the recommended and alternative plan designs um, come in at the high end of the de minimis range at 81.9 and 81.8%. Um, the estimated premium impact is actually based on Waitley's model a little bit lower under the recommended plan design versus uh, the alternative, which has a slightly lower um, medical deductible. And slide 25, now looking at the silver deductible plan, um, this plan has seen kind of more increases year over year than, than the gold or platinum plans. Um, pretty consistently each year, the medical deductible has increased as well as the pharmacy deductible. Um, the out-of-pocket maximum, the medical out-of-pocket maximum has increased each year. Last year, um, changes were also required to uh, the coinsurance um, amount from going from 40% to 50%, as well as changes to the copays, consistent with what we just saw in the gold and, and platinum plan. So um, this plan has seen a lot of changes um, relative to the, the ones at the higher meta levels. So slide 26, looking at the recommended and alternative plan designs, um, the increase to the AB on the 2020 plan design um, was actually a little bit lower with the data changes um, than what we've typically seen in the past on this plan. So it does require changes in order to meet the de minimis requirements um, at 72.1%. However, the changes were quite a bit smaller that were required than what we've seen in past years. So because there were such drastic changes and so, so many changes to the 2020 plan design, um, the preference really was to make kind of smaller changes this year um, as, since we could. So under the 2021 recommended plan design, um, the out-of-pocket mass and the pharmacy out-of-pocket limit were increased. Again, that pharmacy limit is consistent with what we were looking at on the gold and platinum plans and maintains that consistency with the HGHPs. Um, the physical therapy and chiropractic limits or copays were also reduced from $45 to $40. Um, again, this goes back to the proposed regulation um, limiting the chiropractic copay potentially to 125% of the PCP copay. So that change was made in order to uh, meet that requirement should, should it be finalized. Um, under the alternative plan design, we looked at also increasing the medical and pharmacy deductible. Um, however, again, because there were so many changes just made in 2020, the preference was really to make kind of the minimal changes to this plan design for 2021 um, that were possible. Any comments or questions on this? I guess the only question I would have, is there any, any uh, research available that compares the states on each of the, the different out-of-pocket expenses by the different metal levels? Julie, are you aware of any um, good sources? So I'm not aware of any public sources, but CMS does release um, public use file that has the maximum of the pockets for all based on issuers, all regions, but that could be compiled. Is that something you could send us a link to? Uh, sure. Thanks.
Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. I'm assuming we can move on. Yep. Yep. <laughs> We're good <All> to go. Right. <laughs> Great, so I'm on um, slide 28 now. So now we're looking at the silver HHP. Um, again, this, this plan has seen um, some changes, particularly to the uh, medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximums over the years, um, as well as that embedded um, single um, out-of-pocket maximum. So historically, that that maximum has been tied to the uh, federal limit that was that's released. So for 2020, um, that embedded single limit was at 8150. Uh, additionally, in 2016 and 2018, um, the coinsurance rates were were also increased, um, but those have not been increased since, since 2018. So in slide 29, looking at the um, 2021 recommended plan design options. Um, this plan design is uh, right at the high end of the limit in 2020 um, based on the draft calculator. So again, trying to mitigate some of the changes that may be required in future years. Um, the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum were increased under the um, recommended plan design. Additionally, that um, embedded single out-of-pocket maximum was increased to 85.50, so that uh, the, the draft federal limit for 2021, um, and that brings down the AD slightly. The alternative plan design looks at a little bit larger increase to um, the medical deductible. Um, again, trying to weigh the balance between those cost-sharing increases and the premium increases. So you can see down in the very bottom. Uh, row the estimated premium increase impact under the uh, recommended design is 0.7% um, versus 0.5% in the alternative plan design. So ultimately, um, the, the thought was to um, have a smaller increase on, on the deductible as the, the premium impact did not seem um, large enough to, to warrant an additional $50 change in the deductible. I think we're okay. So now moving to, oh. I was just going to say, I think we're good to move on. Great. Okay. Um, so moving to slide 31, now um, we're starting to get into the bronze plan design. So as we mentioned, the, the changes here um, were a little bit tougher to, to get within the de minimis range. Um, so on slide 31, we've got the changes that have occurred year over year for this plan design. Um, so kind of similar to the silver, the medical deductible, the pharmacy deductible, the out-of-pocket max, the medical out-of-pocket maximum has increased just about every um, single year since 2014. The uh, co-insurance and the co-pays are already pretty high in this plan um, and don't tend to move the AV in the calculator a lot. Um, so those have not actually been increased um, with the exception of the specialist copay um, back in 2016 and 2017 and preferred brand in 2017 as well. So looking at 532, um, for this plan, the 2020 plan design was at 64.3%. Um, and the, the limit without qualifying for the expanded range is 62%. So with um, a federal limit of 8550, it was impossible to get this plan design um, to meet uh, the non-expanded, that 62% limit um, on the AD. So in order to qualify for the expanded range, um, the plan needed to offer at least one major service um, prior to the deductible, so with the deductible waived. Um, and the, the regulations list out several different services that qualify um, for as a, as a major service. Um, so what we've done in the recommended and alternative plan design is actually waive the um, deductible, the drug deductible for generic script, um, which is a benefit increase to the members um, since in 2020 that 
deductible would apply to generics prior to, to the $20 copay. Um, the other piece of the expanded um, de minimis range is that um, any copay that's applied to the service for which the deductible is waived um, to qualify as an expanded range, um, that copay needs to be reasonable, which is defined as being less than or equal to 50% of the cost of service. So based on the federal calculator, the average cost for a generic brand script was about $32 in the 2021 calculator. Um, so in order to meet that requirement, the generic copay was also reduced from $20 to $15, so that it's below that 50% threshold. So with these changes, um, the plan design would now be eligible for the expanded um, de minimis range and could go up to an AB of 65% um, instead of 62%. Um, so there's some additional room there. Um, so in addition to increasing uh, to those changes for, for generics, um, the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum uh, were also increased. Um, under the alternative plan design, that medical out-of-pocket maximum was taken all the way up to the federal limit of 8550, um, and the recommended we've left it at 8400. Um, this was based on um, kind of looking at the premium impact and, and what the the difference was in in terms of the increase, the additional increase, the out-of-pocket maximum, and how much that got in terms of the, the estimated premium change. Um, as well as looking back at 2020. So in 2020, the draft regulations um, had an out-of-pocket maximum of 8,200, and in the final regulations, that was actually reduced to 8,150. Um, so there was con some concern that the 8,550 may not stick necessarily um, in the final regulation. So by leaving it at 8,400, there's, there's some room and that the, this plan design would not need to be updated again once those final regulations come out. Um, because this plan design is eligible for that expanded um, AV range, the AV um, is quite a bit higher for 2021 at 64.1% um, compared to 2020 at 62%. Um, so that does result in a larger premium impact than what we've seen on um, the other meta levels so far. So, um, based on Wakeley's modeling, it's a little over 2% premium impact that we're um, showing here. Are there any questions here? I know that's a, a lot of information to take in all at once. Doesn't appear to be. Okay, great. In that case, we'll move on to the other deductible plan. This is the one without the pharmacy limit, um, amongst like 34. Uh, this plan design was new in 2018, so as far as the history, there's only a few years um, of experience for this plan. Um, in both 2019 and 2020, the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums were increased um, each year. This plan design does qualify for that expanded bronze range um, as office visits and generics um, both are uh, not subject to the deductible. So looking at the um, recommended and alternative plan design, um, in uh, the recommended plan design, we've increased the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum um, again to 8,400. Um, with an 8,400 out-of-pocket maximum, the AV was still just barely over the de minimis, de, de minimis range. Um, so in addition, under the recommended plan design, we've also increased the generic pharmacy copay from 25 to $30. Um, and in the alternative, we looked at increasing the specialist office visit from 100 to 110. Um, however, a $100 copay for specialists is already quite high. Um, so ultimately, the, the recommended design was um, chosen, leaving the specialist copay alone and the generic pharmacy copay increase. Um, so I do want to mention on the, the last 
plan design, we had to decrease the generic pharmacy copay um, for $15 to meet that 50% threshold um, and qualify for the expanded bronze range. Under this plan design, we didn't have to do that to generics because um, the PCP and specialist office visits also have deductible waste. Um, and those copays are underneath the 50% um, limit already as is. And the requirement for the expanded bronze range is just that one service has to meet those requirements, not necessarily all services for which the deductible is waived. Um, so I just wanted to make that uh, clarification of looking at the two different plan designs, why, why they look a little bit different in that sense. Brittany, this is Robin. Do you happen to know what the average specialist office visit copay was in the calculator? You know, I don't remember what it was off the top of my um, my mind, but I can pull that and have it send it over or have it ready for next week. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, um, I, I just noticed a pattern in terms of uh, the increase to the, um, uh, the prescription out of pocket uh, maximum. And if, if you go from you know, the trend line from 2014 through the 2021 20, recommendation, they're all at 1.63%. Uh, so um, it just seems that a well, that that's just what happened. Th those are the numbers. Whereas if you look at the uh, changes in the medical out of pocket maximum, they range from a low of 2.64 percent to a high of 6.78 percent trend line uh, for the silver. And so, so it's looking at those over a seven-year period. And I'm just wondering if it would be helpful to you know, explain this process to uh, somebody that's not deeply involved in it. If, if in the analysis, you know, we could have uh, just a, a brief overview of that seven-year trend line for each of these plans um, and kind of why, why one uh, grows at a constant rate, which would be the, the prescription, um, and the others are, are pretty bumpy. Um, I know there's a lot of bumps in the road here, so, but it, it's just trying to um, be able to explain these to people because these are, these are, um, people are passionate about this issue and it's just nice to have as much information, uh, not only year over year, but for a, uh, the longer trend line going back to 2014 and it seems the data is here and uh, it, it wouldn't be that difficult to uh, provide a, a paragraph on each as to do why there's a variance for the, the medical out-of-pocket maximum, but not for um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the drug out-of-pocket maximum, maximum. Yeah, so the drug out-of-pocket maximum um, is limited to the minimum deductible for HHPs, um, and that is based on a Vermont regulation. Uh, so because that minimum deductible is not increasing nearly as quickly um, as the, the federal um, out-of-pocket maximum has been, uh, there's, there's a limit in how much that, that pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum can increase. Um, and because we're tied to this, this federal calculator, um, because we can only increase the pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum so much because of that regulation, um, larger changes are needed for other service categories, including that medical out-of-pocket maximum and deductibles and, and co-pays and so forth, um, to kind of accommodate that, that limit on the pharmacy side. Okay, I think we can go on. All right, great. So slide 37, um, we've made it to the last slide design, the bronze uh, high deductible health plan. Um, so similar to the silver HGHP, um, this plan um, has seen increases in the 
medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum pretty consistently each year. Um, again, that embedded uh, single out-of-pocket maximum has been tied to the federal limit, so it has also increased each year. Um, and in 2020, was set at that 81.50 limit. Um, so looking at the recommended design options, um, this the 2020 plan design is actually within the de minimis range still. Um, as an HDHP, uh, this plan is already eligible for the expanded bronze range. That is one of, one of the notes that if it's an HDHP, it automatically qualifies for that expanded range. Um, so under the 2021, sorry, 2021 recommended plan design, um, we've increased that medical out-of-pocket maximum from 6750 to 6900. Um, and again, increase the embedded single out-of-pocket maximum to that federal limit at 8550. Um, however, kind of keeping any other changes very minimal um, for this plan design. Um, so in this case, the recommended design is looking at a 1.1% estimated premium impact based on a weekly model. Um, and under the alternative, uh, which basically keeps the 2020 plan design exactly the same with the exception of that increase to the embedded single limit, um, that premium impact is 1.5%. So looking at making some minimal incremental changes to the plan design each year in order to try and um, avoid some larger changes potentially in, in next year or future years. Um, so again, on, on slide 40, um, we've placed the uh, table. This is the same one that was um, back at the beginning of the presentation, just highlighting all of the different changes um, in the recommended plan design relative to 2020. Um, so again, the bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit and without the pharmacy limit are uh, the two plans that require formal approval. However, we've listed all of the changes um, that we've gone through here uh, for reference. We also have um, quite a bit of information in the appendices of the presentation. Um, we won't necessarily, don't need to spend time going through that, but you do have that information with you. Um, so that includes the CSR plan design changes. Um, so again, these are limited to the uh, base silver plan designs um, and are determined by that. So we've included those plan designs for reference, even though they don't require um, approval. Um, and then we've also just provided a couple of summaries of all of the recommended plan design options kind of side by side so you can see the progression from um, the platinum metal level down to bronze um, for all of the different plan designs. Is there any, any other questions at this point? Doesn't appear to be any other questions. Okay. Do you have any questions for anybody other than the actual song? Yes. So I um, I didn't catch Kevin's eye at the beginning when we went through the, the early part. Um, but I uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, last year, Sean Sheehan, who I know is no longer with you, did a very nice uh, uh, graphic that compared the 2018 to the 2019. Um, uh, um, plans uh, by uh, by um, federal poverty level and um, also by you know, single couple families, etc. And it blended in the um, advanced premium tax credit as well as Dr. Dinosaur benefits. So it was a very um, uh, just a very nicely designed uh, template, which I I think um, is still available. Um, I know uh, our Agatha, you know, uh, had some, some, it was helping there. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if it's possible to, you know, because, you know, we have the 2020 data here, but we don't have it in comparison to the 2019. Um, and, uh, and we also don't have it in a way that blends in the, the federal subsidies uh, and the Dr. Dinosaur subsidies, um, especially. And, 
So I'm wondering if, if that's something that you might consider replicating for 2020 um, over 2019. Um, sure. I, I, let me make sure I understand. I, I do remember Sean doing the work, and we might just need to dig up his template. I, so you're looking for its enrollment information based on um, federal? No, it, it, it wasn't enrollment. It was like, for example, I have here the, the 2019 over 2018. Oh, great. And you can easily look at this and see that, for example, for a, a, a couple uh, with a, a bronze plan that um, with all of their, with, with the subsidies that are available at 400% uh, uh, of poverty, they're spending 150 bucks a month in uh, premium uh, or 2.73% of their income over the year. Whereas if you cross the line uh, to above 400% of poverty, the premium jumps to $852 a month uh, with no subsidies, because there are none. Um, and if that's 13.8% of, of that household's income. And uh, you know this. This this to me is you know is the um, the premium cliff, which is noted you know, you know um, straight ahead in the weekly report that came out December first. Um, and in there uh, um, was a, a a proposal that would cost about 2.2 .2 million to kind of fill that gap between 400 percent of poverty and 500 percent of poverty. Um, and to me. This premium increase, this cliff, is a kind of an open wound. It's, a, it's something that uh, is very small in number. If you do the math, it's maybe uh, 2,200, you know, enrollees that are affected by it. But but the increase is so dramatic, and uh, we have a recommendation now uh, um, carved out you know, by the actuaries that for 2.2 million. Um, we could uh, provide uh, everybody between, well, the enrollees between 400% of poverty and 500% of poverty with a 10% reduction uh, in their premium. And that's something that, that I just don't see why we don't do, because it's short money in the scheme of things. Um, and uh, it is such a dramatic um, uh, cliff that making progress towards the good, I think, is something that we would all like to see. Um. Okay, so I, I do understand the data request around premiums. I um, I think we're happy to work on that. I I can I just clarify? It, it doesn't sound like it's relevant to the uh, approval of the plan designs for 2021. Is that a fair statement? Or it, uh, I, 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 I you know I think there are silos here, but I think it is relevant. I think that in the beginning, the first two or three pages, folks talked about affordability. Um, there's another page here where people are talking about um, silver loading, which has a and, and how the increase in the um, advanced premium tax credit was was kind of the the, uh, the balm that allowed, which is a good thing. It was a good thing to do. Um, I I um, I just think that as we're talking about plans, uh, we should have a conversation about affordability and where that is most salient is uh, in in that 400 percent of poverty region. And uh, to me, it's it's not a hard problem to solve. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, uh, so you know, I, I want it uh, transparent that that is a problem, and B is to talk to folks and encourage folks to, to try to solve it. Yeah, okay, so we definitely agree about the problem, and, and obviously that's one of the reasons why we commissioned the report, um, or working through the legislature. I will say um, I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to provide that data in order to inform the decision on the timeline that we need for this set of plans. Um, so I think we're happy to work on that, but I, I just want to be, um, I don't want to overpromise in terms of our ability to get that data in this, yeah. for this. I, I, I do have a copy of, of uh, Sean's work that I can send to you. Um, um, you know, it's obviously going to take some work to kind of update it, but I think the template um, is, is, is pretty well structured. Great, yeah, it would be really helpful to see that. Again. And the other thing I, I am wondering is, why, uh, why uh, hasn't the department kind of embraced the Wakeley, one of the Wakeley recommendations um, in terms of, of mitigating this cliff and, and even picking the one which is the cheapest, which is the 2.2 .2 million one that would affect, um, you know, give people some, some significant uh, relief. Right? I, I just don't understand why that hangs out there 
has a sore thumb and it's just not being tended to. Yeah, I think I need to defer to the, um, you know, we put a cover memo on that report when it was submitted this, this winter. And as you know, as minor as it may seem, there is a significant budget impact and, and it you know, did not make its way into the budget proposal for this year. So um, I think we're happy to keep looking at it, but I, I need to just defer to what we have already said in terms of that, um, those proposals that were in the report. Well, given my, my old hat, I have four or five ideas that are pretty simple about how to fund this. Um, and, you know, for things like uh, uh, the transition from the state um, health care resource fund to the general fund uh, is, a, is a transition from a special fund to a general fund. Uh, in a special fund, um, interest is earned um, statutorily, and I've double checked, and, and that still stands for the health care resource funds and the general funds. That interest just goes to the general fund and is not preserved for, um, for for benefits. There's other things like the author's report on Dr. Dinosaur, which is a, a, a $2.4 million uh, fix that uh, the staff said would be fixed 24, in 24 months, which was 12 months ago, so the timing there makes sense. Um, I just know that with as you will, there's a way these things can be fixed, and that this is not in the context of, of DIVA's budget dropping from uh, $245 million in 2019 down to, uh, I'm sorry, $745 million to $711 million. The wind is at your back now. Your caseloads are dropping. The, your appropriations are, are, you know, are, are being made available somewhere. That money's going somewhere. And I just, I, I, I just, I, I, I can't get my arms around walking away from uh, people that are facing this club. Understood. Okay, are there other questions? I just have a quick one. Um, I'm sensitive to some public comment we received uh, last week or two weeks ago about the number of plans and sort of worrying about information overload for consumers. So I'm wondering uh, how you, you know, arrived at the number, the optimal number, 28. Yeah, much thought that that feel like the right number from what consumers can digest and choose from and, and all of that. We talk about the history. Yeah, the we've incrementally added a couple of plans over the years in a very conservative way. We've not been in a position that yet to sunset any plans, um, but I don't know the. We've also either arrived at the what's the right number, you know, especially in the in the bronze area. We wonder sometimes if if there are too many, but it, it could be disruptive to the market to to sunset any. But um, that's not to say we wouldn't look at that. But the original number of plans is is longstanding. Yes. So it's just for the history of the program, we've had the same number of plans, and we've only added we've added a few bronze plans because of the issue with the prescription drug out of pocket preventing. Right. Um, p potentially preventing us from making compliant bronze plans and allowing for other flexibilities in that design. So I think that's where we added a few, but otherwise it's been pretty um, uh, st status quo, right? There was a, a non-standard gold and right. non-standard silver added um, over the course of the time. Non-standard um, is right. And the non-standard, those additions, my recollection was that that uh, was a very popular plan that was sunset uh, the first year, and we got a lot of consumer demand for that because those were the plans where the deductible and the out-of-pocket max are the same, right? Right. Yes. And so that uh, was added because of the amount of contact with, quite frankly, the governor's office with people saying, "Why did you take away this plan? I loved it." Mm -hmm. First one at the gold level, and then one at the silver level. Okay. Came back. Do you think that you know now that there has been some somewhat of stability in the types of plans, and even the changes that are there are always a lot of moving parts I think with with consumer education and, and all of the things that do change so I think uh, looking at the you know always consideration of the right number of plans is important and I would just add, I think that the consumer education piece has changed a little bit. I think in the early years of the program, we were 
um, for operational reasons, largely encouraging people to stay where they were. And um, over recent years, because of the influx of subsidies through silver loading, and um, we've kind of changed the message to be really examine your options and put made tools available to facilitate that, um, including the plane comparison tool that Dana referenced earlier. So. Um, so I think that it's it's been a bit of an evolution in terms of, of, of the consumer education piece. And, you know, maybe if we find some stability with the, the subsidies, which is that's always the question, um, maybe we are at a time to kind of re-examine re -examine the numbers. Um, but I think it's a, a, there's a learning curve. And are, is there a way to measure the, the use of the uh, plant comparison tool over time? And a lot of people using that and feel like there's been a more trajectory in people's use of that? Or? Yes, we do have that data, and there has been a, indeed an upward trajectory. I don't know um, where the most recent numbers have been published or that we put anything out for this past open enrollment, but um, we typically do a report based on open enrollment, and so I think that's something that we would include in there um, sometime during this first quarter. Thank you. Sure. Anything else from the board? Now we'll open it up to the public for comments. Seeing none, uh, thank you for the presentation, and uh, we'll be back at this topic soon. Okay, and we've noted the questions and takeaways, so thank you for your your time. Thank you. Julie and Brittany, I think we're all set. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Is there any old business to please look forward to this time? Seeing none, is there any new business to look forward to this time? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Good move and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.